Welcome back to ECE 501B, one class period away from or removed from our second exam. The second exam is Wednesday. Practice material you should be able to find on D2L. Homework number six is due today at 11.59, so hopefully that won't cut into your evening plans, but maybe between handing out treats, you can work some of the problems if you haven't already finished. As a reminder, deliverable number one for your project, which is really just sort of a here's what I plan to do and hopefully I will be able to respond to those emails or comments if you just upload it onto the Dropbox. But the main project work, deliverable number two, is due a week or a month later on the 7th of December. Today what I want to do in class is just very briefly tell you what I'm thinking relative to the process for exam number two. Again, you can obtain some previously assigned exams and their solutions on homework or for exam number two on D2L. We will continue with our Chapter 7 material, recapping a little bit about the adjoint map and then the self-adjoint operator. I think that's really sort of where we stopped last time is what happens when we have the adjoint and the operator or the linear map or the linear operator equal to each other to themselves, then we have a self-adjoint operator. We want to then examine the behavior of a very simple linear map, and as simple as we can get would be one that gives rise to a one-by-one -one matrix. That's really just now a scalar mapping, and we'll look at what that means relative to if we do want to find its adjoint. Then we will look at propositions and corollaries for self-adjoint maps. We will introduce the concept of a normal operator, which really just says that the map and its adjoint commute. That doesn't mean they're self-adjoint. It doesn't mean they're equal. It just means that they commute. Or T, T dagger is equivalent or equal to T dagger T. That's what we're meaning by a normal operator. Then it's clear maybe that if you have equality between the adjoint and the map or you have a self-adjoint operator, that implies that that operator is normal. But the other way around is not necessarily the case. And we'll go through a, a matrix example that shows that a normal operator does not necessarily imply a self-adjoint operator. Then we can connect norms with normal operators and show that if we have a normal operator, then the norm of the linear map on a vector V is equivalent to the adjoint applied to that same vector. And then we'll start connecting eigenvalues and eigenvectors for the map and its adjoint. And then we'll state a result concerning normal operators and distinct eigenvalues, which would then imply that we have orthogonal eigenvectors. And all of that is leading us up to this nice result of what does it mean to have a nice operator? Or can we now diagonalize these maps that we have when we're thinking about them in terms of a matrix? And those are our spectral theorems, meaning when is a map diagonalizable. And that depends on whether you're dealing with a complex field or a real field. And those two cases we will examine separately, but essentially you need only to have a normal operator to have a diagonalizable matrix or for a map in the complex case, but in the real case you needed a little bit more structure and there you need it to be a self-adjoint operator. And we'll get to that, maybe not today, uh, 
which means maybe not this week since we have our exam the next period, but that's forthcoming. Relative to exam number two, in terms of the process, the thing that has changed is that I am allowing you one more sheet of notes if you need it, which means now you have six sides of eight and a half by 11 pieces of paper, but just bring in three pages and you can then have front and back on those three pages. You're allowed a calculator, something to write with, and the last item is the nose. No textbook, no class notes, no cell phones, no neighbor, no computer. In terms of the material, it's really what we've done since exam number one, and that's chapters five and six. We're de dealing then with eigenvalues and eigenvectors and inner product spaces, which means that we can ask questions relative to inner products. And how do we create inner products? How can we define those, et cetera? Or what properties do we have to have in existence for a function to be an inner product? And really, the inner product, one general way of thinking of that is now you're taking these two vectors and producing a scalar. That's the high-level view of an inner product. And you might want to remind yourself that all the contents from homeworks 4, 5, and 6 are fair game for exam number two, and you'll want to be able to then apply the theory associated with or behind homeworks four, five, and six. Moving on then to material for this period, let's recap a little bit about maps or those adjoint maps. And we were symbolizing those by this dagger symbol. If we had a linear map T, then its adjoint could be defined via inner products. By equating two inner products, we had TV comma W inner product. That needs to equal, by the definition of the adjoint, the inner product of V with T dagger W. That's how we defined the adjoint where now the linear map could be going between two different vector spaces, an input vector space V and an output vector space W, that would then re be reflected in the adjoint going from W as its input vector space and V as its output vector space. Where this inner product relationship on the map and its adjoint really just says the adjoint is being defined in a way that produces the same scalar when we sort of slide that mapping between the first slot and the second slot. That's really what this adjoint is allowing us to do. Maybe we don't want this map in the first slot, then we need the adjoint to push it over into the second slot and maybe that's what we want in our development or in whatever we are talking about relative to a particular inner product or relationship that we're working on. But the adjoint really is just another linear map and it allows us to slide that map from the first slot to the second slot. We then quickly mentioned self-adjoint operators last time, but now just in the terminology or in the description, you can start to get a sense of what that actually means. In terms of self-adjoint operator, if the map, linear map, is equal to its adjoint, then that immediately starts putting this connection between the input space and the output space. And in particular, if T is equal to T dagger, 
then we're really only operating on one vector space and now we, we have an operator and T and T dagger, if you think about those in terms of a matrix, you now have this square matrix, the matrix representation of those. So a self-adjoint operator really just means that if we were to slide that linear map from the first slot to the second slot, we could really not have to even say T dagger, we could just say T in the second slot if we have a self-adjoint operator. And in that case, we would have this inner product relationship that might say the inner product of TV comma W is equal to the inner product of V comma TW if we have a self-adjoint map. Let's look at what that means for a somewhat simple case. Suppose that we now have a vector x, y. It's two-dimensional. And the linear map now takes x, y into the first coordinate and the second coordinate of the output vector by scaling x and y by two different scalars. AX plus BY for the first coordinate, and the second coordinate is CX plus DY. If we assume that we're dealing with the standard orthonormal basis, where we have ones in the, let's say, the nth position and zeros elsewhere in our basis vectors, then we could rewrite that linear map as a matrix A being first row A, B, the second row C, D. And if you now apply that A matrix to this vector X, Y, you will then generate the appropriate first and second coordinates in the linear map above. A, X plus B, Y in the first coordinate and C, X plus D, Y in the second coordinate. If we're now dealing with an orthonormal set of basis vectors, then the matrix representation of the adjoint is equal to the conjugate transpose of the matrix representation of the original linear map T. If we now take the complex conjugate transpose of A, we now have B. B is just transposing A and conjugating every entry. And that's now the relationship between the matrix representation of T and the matrix representation of its adjoint. If we now say, well, before we do that, this would now be what the adjoint map would look like if we put it into the same structure as our linear map. We can pull that immediately from the structure of B. We now have the conjugate of A scaling X plus the conjugate of C scaling Y for the first coordinate of the linear map T dagger or the adjoint of T. And the second coordinate is then B star or the, B, the complex conjugate of B scaling X plus the complex conjugate of D scaling Y. If we say that T is equal to its adjoint, then that's what we mean by the operator being self-adjoint. But that now says what relative to these matrix representations? If T is equal to T dagger, then the matrix A is equal to the matrix B. In the above linear map, T that was defined earlier, if it's self-adjoint or self-adjoint, then A is equal to B, or that now imposes particular relationships on these four elements. If A is equal to B, then A is equal to A star, or A is equal to its conjugate. B is equal to the conjugate of C, 
And if you look at the 2, 1 entry, C is equal to the conjugate of B. And if you conjugate those, you get back what you just had in the 1, 2 entry. And D is equal to its complex conjugate. Which really now says that if we have a linear map, in this case we're on this two-dimensional space and we're dealing with complex conjugates, so we're over the complex field. If A is equal to its conjugate and D is equal to its, con its conjugate, and those were on the diagonal, then in order for a complex number to equal its complex conjugate, that number has to be real. That means for self-adjoint maps, we need the diagonal of our matrix representation to be real. And the off diagonals are simply conjugates of their elements. So if you transpose, well, well this is what you get in the two-dimensional case, if we generalize that to the nth dimensional case, then we have the following bigger matrix representation of this linear map. We have A11, A22, those are actually going to be real on the diagonal. But the off diagonals, the transposed elements are conjugates of each other. Meaning if we simply threw everything away below and beyond the 2-2 two, two submatrix, we should get back the result that we just had. And in that case, the B is now corresponding to A sub 1-2. And that's now equal to C, which is, or the conjugate of C, which is A 1-2 star. This is now just the expanded or the general form, the generalized form, when we go to a higher dimensional linear map, T, and its matrix representation. In this map, then, we have all of the diagonal entries real, and the off diagonals are related by the complex conjugate relationship. And this particular structure is true for any basis that we might want to form the matrix representation of the linear map T4. And one way to think about this would be the simple case which would be a diagonal matrix. And if we had a diagonal matrix, that satisfies this structure as long as our diagonal elements are real. Then the off diagonal is if they're all zero, they're equal to the complex conjugate. So a diagonal matrix that's real on the diagonal is self-adjoint. That's sort of the simplest way or the simplest matrix representation to think of. And that's really sort of where we want to end up with these spectral theorems, is finding a basis that allows us to form these nice matrices, and nice, remember, meant with a lot of zeros. And if we have a lot of zeros, if we have a diagonal matrix, then all of the information in terms of scaling and well, that's really all it's doing in that particular basis. That's now scaling relative to those eigenvalues. Those eigenvalues are doing the scaling behavior. That's a real quick overview of what it means to be self-adjoint. Let's now look at a particular simple map. Obviously, that was an n-order map. Let's go back in the opposite direction and look at a one-by-one -one map and see what it means for that map to be self-adjoint. Let's examine 
a simple map and see how the concepts might generalize. And in fact, what we are going to do is we will have a simple example showing that the matrix representation of an adjoint is, in fact, the complex conjugate if we're dealing with this simple map, the transpose really doesn't matter. Since we transpose a scalar, we get back the scalar. But in general, the complex conjugate transpose of the original map. Which we are denoting T. Or stated another way, the matrix representation of the adjoint map is equal to the matrix representation of the original linear map T's complex conjugate transpose. Let's now show this relationship actually falls out by just looking at a simple example. In this simple example, suppose that we have a linear map T that takes us from a complex vector space that's one by one, so it's now just the complex numbers into the complex numbers. This is just a linear map from C to shining C, from C to C. So we're going from the complex number and we're now taking a scalar which is belonging to this complex field and using that to map to in, back into the complex numbers. That we could then represent as, let's say, x now belongs or lives in C. Let's now define the linear map a applied to x as just being ax, where in this case A is now a scalar, which we've generally denoted as F, but in this case let's just go ahead and say that's in C, it's complex, and our elements in the vector space, which we're denoting as X, they also belong to the complex numbers. We can now think of A in several different ways. One way to think about it in a more maybe involved manner is to say A, this complex number, is actually a one by one matrix. That's a scalar. A scalar is a one-by-one one matrix. It's complex. A is now this complex scalar or we can think of it as a complex one-by-one one matrix. 
which allows us to immediately think about what the matrix representation of this linear map, T, looks like. The matrix representation of this linear map T, which we've been denoting as capital or script M of T, what is that if this is now our linear map T that we defined in the top line on the screen right now? What would the matrix representation of that linear map look like? That's just A. And again, we could say, oh, this A is a one-by-one one matrix, which really just says it belongs to this complex number field, C. That's now our matrix representation of T, but let's use this definition of the linear map T on X and what we know about inner products and adjoints to see what the adjoint is going to look like structurally as a linear map. Let's apply the definition. of the adjoint to see what the matrix representation of the adjoint of this one by one matrix what it looks like. In this process let's just start then with the governing definition of the adjoint. The definition of the adjoint is this equality of inner products. We have two inner products and they're equal to each other and that's what defines the adjoint. In this case we have Tx comma V, the inner product of that, those two vectors. By the definition of the adjoint that is equal to X inner product with the adjoint of T applied to V, or T dagger V. That's just the definition of the adjoint. Let's now use the Euclidean inner product to make these inner, or to form these inner products on both sides of the equality. And in this case, we simply have one component in each vector. The Euclidean inner product takes the components in the first slot and scales those by the first co the conjugate of the first slot in the sec or the first component in the second slot. But here we only have one component. We're just dealing with a one by one vector space. So in this case, we have Tx, that's the first coordinate in the first slot, the only coordinate in the first slot, times the conjugate of the first coordinate in the second slot, which in this case is just V, so we need to conjugate V. That's what the left-hand side looks like as far as a scalar. That's the inner product, the Euclidean inner product of the inner product of Tx with V. The right hand side, now we take the first coordinate, which is x, and multiply that by the first coordinate conjugated from the second slot, which in this case is t dagger 
applied to V, and we need to now take the complex conjugate of that. That's just the definition of the two inner products, the Euclid, using the Euclidean inner product. But what did we say Tx actually was equal to in terms of this linear map in this simple example? That was just Ax. So now we have this Ax. That's what this is by the definition of t, and that's now equal to, I'm sorry, scaling the conjugate of v. And on the right-hand side, we have x, but now let's go ahead and just say that t dagger, we don't know what it is, but it's going to be some complex scalar. Let's just introduce a new unknown scalar. Let's call it b. So let's say T dagger V produces BV, where B is an unknown scalar. And we need to conjugate that. If B is a scalar and V is a scalar, what's the conjugate of that product look like? If I have a complex number times another complex number and I conjugate that product, can I do anything with those two individual pieces in that product as far as relation, relating those to the conjugates? So BV, if that's a complex number and I conjugate that, that's equal to the product of the conjugates, right? The conjugate of the product is equal to the product of the conjugates, so that I can now rewrite this as x times the conjugate of B times the conjugate of V. That's just what I can do with complex numbers. But remember, B conjugate, B is a scalar. And it can then slide out or be moved around that triple product. Let's now put the conjugate of B out front so that we now have B conjugate times X V star. That's just because we can slide this scalar around X, B, and V are all three scalars, so if I had 2 times 3 times 4, that's the same as 3 times 2 times 4. That's all I'm saying. It's just a scalar, and I can now slide that out. It doesn't matter the ordering of those scalar products. A times B times C is the same as B times, maybe I shouldn't be using A's and B's, but you can interchange those scalars in terms of the product, and the product will be the same. Now, if I look at the leftmost entry in that chain of equalities and compare it to the right chain, or the right side, do you see that x, v, star is the same in both? The only thing that's different now is what actually has to be equal or this relationship now, all based on just the definition of the adjoint, has now, is now telling us that A, in our linear map, T, needs to be the same as the complex conjugate of B. Or, if I conjugate that equation, I now can say that B has to equal the complex conjugate of A. But how did we define? B was our unknown scalar that was representing the adjoint operation T dagger, which now says that if I had T dagger V, 
that's the same as BV, which is really now just the conjugate of A times V. Or, if I now had T dagger applied to V, we defined that to be BV, but now we've found through this adjoint definition of equality of inner products that that's equal to the complex conjugate of A times V. That's what the linear map of the adjoint looks like. We do the adjoint applied to V, V is a scalar in this case, then if T was A times X, its adjoint is now the conjugate of A. Or, what's the matrix representation now of T dagger? If the matrix representation of the original map was A, then the matrix representation of T dagger is B, but we've now demonstrated that this unknown scalar B actually has to be equal to the conjugate of A, meaning the matrix representation of the adjoint of T is now the complex conjugate of A. Question? So now the question was commutativity, where does that play? Don't forget that in this case, in this case, B was a scalar. And it's a one-by-one one matrix. All we're doing is right now just talking about the simple case of what this might look like at, in terms of the adjoint definition. And then if you needed to generalize it, obviously you would have to work through a more complicated or involved process. But I'm just trying to say, let's get a feel for what this adjoint means. And it's not that big of a deal. In the simplest case, the adjoint is really just like conjugating a, the scalar if the scalar is our original map. Therefore, the adjoint map, or the adjoint of a map, where our map would, be, would have been T, is the generalization of the complex conjugate of a complex number. In the simplest case, then, when we're dealing with these one-by-one one maps or, yeah, one-by-one one vector spaces or one-dimensional vector spaces, then we can be thinking of an adjoint being equivalent to the conjugate of the original map. And the adjoint map or the adjoint of a map is really just the generalization of that when we go to higher dimensions. What about a self-adjoint operator in this example? If we impose this restriction that we want this operator to be self-adjoint, then that says that we want the map T to equal its adjoint, or T to equal T dagger, relative to what we've just derived for this simple case, 
that now would say that A is equal to A star. Or if we want a self-adjoint operator, what does that say about the behavior, the nature of A? A is real. We can now actually build up a table that sort of makes this connection and this generalization of numbers with maps. For example, in the left column, let's make that a column of numbers. And in the right column, let's say that now generalizes into a particular map. What I'm wanting to say is suppose that we look at the num a complex number, A1 plus JB1. If we have a complex number, then in that trivial or that simple example that we just completed, that's what we were associating with T, a linear map. If we wanted to talk about the adjoint of that linear map, T dagger, which means that we now have this equality of inner products, TV inner product with W is equal to the inner product of V with T dagger W. <coughs> What does that look like in terms of a number? This is now just the adjoint. So if T is our linear map, what's the adjoint map look like if our linear map corresponded to a number in the simple case? What would, did the adjoint map correspond to? The conjugate. So now our number for the adjoint is really just the complex conjugate of the num complex number associated with the linear map. Or this is now A1 minus JB1. And finally, if we now complete this table and say, let's now require the linear map to be self-adjoint, which now says that in the inner product relationship, we have the inner product of TV with W equaling V inner product with TW. What does that now correspond to as far as a number? That's the real. So now we have Z is equal to A1 or a real number. Meaning, before you get too caught up in linear maps and adjoints and self-adjoint, just sort of reflect on this table and say, it's not that big of a deal. In the simplest case, the adjoint is like taking the conjugate of a complex number. And the self-adjoint just restricts that complex number to actually be purely real. Now, with that sort of relationship between the simple and the more general in terms of a linear map, the adjoint, and a self-adjoint map. Let's see what some of these properties now produce relative to eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And the first one is now proposition, proposition, proposition 13 in chapter 7, which now says the eigenvalues of a self-adjoint map 
are actually real. That's the title given to Proposition 13 in Chapter 7, and the statement is every eigenvalue of a self-adjoint operator is real. And now that we know quite a bit about all of these different linear algebra concepts, let's work through the proof of this. First, we're starting with a linear map that's actually more specific than that. It's now an operator. Its input vector space is the same as its output vector space. It's square. It's mapping back into itself. That's the linear map. And we're also saying that this linear map is self-adjoint, which means that T is equal to T dagger. And now we're commenting on the eigenvalues of that operator. And for that reason, let's just introduce some notation. Let's introduce the eigenvalue eigenvector equation and say that TV is going to equal lambda V. So this is now saying lambda and V are the I are an eigenvalue and eigenvector pair associated with this linear map T. And now let's just start off with a particular expression. Let's say that we now scale or use the eigenvalue to scale the square of the norm of our eigenvector. But you now know how to play. That's kind of why we like to just take the norm squared, because now we can put it cleanly into what other operation that we've just learned about. In Chapter 6, we were playing with inner products. So now we can rewrite this formula in terms of an inner product. What's the norm squared in terms of an inner product? That's just the inner product of V with itself, meaning I can now, from the definition of the norm, I can now say that this is equal to lambda times the inner product of V with itself. This is coming from the definition of the norm. Now I can start playing with some of the properties of my inner product. What if I want to put that eigenvalue inside the inner product? Maybe I don't want this inner product scaled outside of the inner product. I want to put that scalar inside. And maybe I want that scalar in the first slot. How does that happen? Or what does that give me? So now my homogeneity of the first slot allows that scalar to just slide in without any kind of conjugation or anything adjusting that scalar. It just slides in by itself. The homogeneity of the first slot allows me to then write the inner product of lambda v with v. And now we can just start playing. <laughs> what do we know lambda v is? Lambda v was the right-hand side of our eigenvalue eigenvector equation, which now says, oh, we can write that first slot expression as tv. Let's do that. So now we can say, OK, that entire 
set of equalities can be rewritten as the inner product of TV with V using the eigenvalue eigenvector equation, and I'll just abbreviate that as the eigen equation, so I don't have to write out vector and values, but this is the eigenvalue eigenvector equation relationship. But knowing what I know about adjoints and inner products, what if I move that linear map to the second slot? I can do that by saying, oh, this is equal to the inner product of V with T dagger V. That's the definition of the adjoint. But what did we say about the adjoint and the linear map T in the first statement of our proposition? It's self-adjoint, which means that that T dagger is equivalent to T, meaning now in the second slot, I actually can just write TV because T was self-adjoint. And now let's just go back. What's TV? That's lambda v. So this is now v comma lambda v. That again is using the eigenvalue eigenvector equation. And if I want to pull that scalar out of the second slot, what happens when it pops out of the inner product? Now, because of the conjugate homogeneity of the second slot, I now have lambda star times the inner product of V with itself. And what's the inner product of V with itself? That's the norm squared of V. I now have that norm squared scaled by lambda star. And now I can look at what I have obtained at the very bottom with what I started with, which was lambda V squared, or the norm of V squared. And that's equal to the conjugate of lambda times the norm of V squared. Or now we've shown that lambda norm of V squared is equal to the conjugate of lambda norm of V squared, which implies what? Well, the norm hasn't changed. So this now for equality to hold, we must have lambda must equal lambda star. And the lambda was our eigenvalue. And what's that say? Well, if we have a self-adjoint operator, then the eigenvalues have to be real, since they equal their conjugate. Therefore, all eigenvalues of a self-adjoint operator are real. And that was pretty easy to determine just by following through all these relationships that we now know how to deal with. Let's now simply write down some of these corollaries and propositions that follow from these relationships. several propositions and corollaries. from our textbook. And we won't go through these proofs.
I'll refer you to the book. So the first one that we will talk about is Proposition 14, which says, over the field of complex numbers, over C, TV is orthogonal to vector V for all vectors V only for the zero operator. That's the title of that proposition. Or, this is now saying, if we're living on a complex inner product space, if V is a complex, let me abbreviate that since you might want to be texting this and you know what it stands for now. If V is a complex inner product space, and T is a linear operator on that complex inner product space such that the inner product of TV with V is equal to zero for all vectors V in this complex inner product space, then in fact the only linear map that that will be true for is the zero map. Meaning if you now have this inner product and it's always giving you zero for all vectors V, then that linear map must be the zero map. Maps everything to the zero vector. A corollary, 715, is again over the complex field C, the inner product of TV with V is real for all vectors V only for self-adjoint operators. In this case, we can say then if V is a complex inner product space and T is a linear map on that complex inner product space, then this linear map T is self-adjoint if and only if when we're forming the inner product of this linear map applied to a vector V with, its, with the original vector V, if that inner product ends up being real for all vectors, then we know that that linear map T was self-adjoint. And it's critical, actually, for that to be happening on a complex inner product space. We could find a real inner product space where the linear map doesn't have to be self-adjoint and it produces an inner product that's real for all vectors V. So the fact that we're playing in a complex inner product space is critical in that corollary. So if we're playing on a complex inner product space and we have a linear map that always produces through this inner product a real scalar, then we know that that linear map is self-adjoint. 
another proposition is proposition 16. And that says that if t is equal to t dagger, and what's that really saying? That our linear map is self-adjoint. If we have a self-adjoint operator and the inner product of t v with v is equal to 0 for all vectors v, then this linear map or linear operator is the zero map. And notice that I didn't include any statement about working on a complex inner product space. But what I have done is I've restricted this linear map to be self-adjoint. Before, it was just an operator. But there, we were playing on a complex inner product space. So there's the distinction between 14 and 16. Here, if t is a self-adjoint operator on v, such that the inner product of TV with V is equal to zero for all vectors on our vector space V, then that linear map is actually the zero map. Maps everything to the zero vector. In this case, Proposition 16 extends Proposition 14 in Chapter 7 to real inner product spaces. But it adds the requirement of a self-adjoint operator. Let's look at the following question. Why do we need this linear map T to be self-adjoint in Proposition 16 when dealing with real inner product spaces. Let's look at an example. And this example is really showing that we can have a real non-zero linear map that actually has an inner product that equals zero for any vector v in our vector space and the reason we can do that or the reason for or the distinction between this example and proposition 716 is here this linear map is not necessarily self-adjoint. So here let's look at an example. Suppose we're dealing with our vector space being two-dimensional real. And suppose that our linear map applied to this two-dimensional vector that has coordinates or components x and y. Suppose that now produces first coordinate by 
and or beta y and second coordinate minus beta x. And if you look at the matrix representation of T, hopefully that shows you that this linear map T is not self-adjoint. If it was, if we took the complex conjugate transpose of this matrix representation, it would equal itself. And in this case, it's not because of that negative sign on the off-diagonal. Notice T is not self-adjoint. And if you remember what this actually means as far as a matrix, this particular matrix is purely or has purely imaginary eigenvalues. And those eigenvalues are actually plus and minus j beta. So in terms of over the field of real numbers, we, this matrix does not possess eigenvalues. This has complex eigenvalues, which if we were, de and this is what we're saying, we're living in R2. If you just looked at this generically as a matrix, you would say, oh, its eigenvalues are purely imaginary. But in this case, this matrix or this linear map does not possess any eigenvalues. But let's see what happens. If we now look at the inner product of T applied to XY, with the vector xy. So this is now tv inner product with v. tv gives us the vector, having trouble making betas, but this is now beta y comma minus beta x. That's the first vector. That's the output vector of applying t to xy, and we want to now inner product that with the original vector xy. And if we do that, what do we have? Well, we just multiply. We're dealing in R, so we don't even have to worry about conjugating anything. We just component-wise multiply and add those pieces together. The first coordinate in the vectors then get multiplied together, and that's beta y times x. And we add that to the product of the second coordinates, which in this case is minus beta x, y. Beta x and y are scalars, and what does that give us? That gives us zero. And that's true for all x, y, and beta that are real. Or what does that example now show? That says we can have a non-zero linear map that produces an inner product of zero for all v. And that's In Proposition 714, that's what we were saying, but in this one we were dealing with a conclusion that our map was zero, but that's because we were dealing with an inner product space that was complex. If we restrict that to being a real inner product space, then we can actually produce an example that is non-zero, our linear map is non-zero, but the inner product will always be zero. That's now what we can talk about in terms of self-adjoint. Let's move one more step down the road, and that is to talk about this new operator called a normal operator. A normal operator 
on an inner product space is one where the linear map T or the linear operator T commutes with its adjoint T dagger. Or that really just says that if I looked at concatenating the map T with T dagger or applying T dagger and then T, that's equivalent to, since they commute, that's equivalent to T dagger T. There's a couple of different consequences of a normal operator. All self-adjoint operators are normal. And that's just because T and T dagger are the same, so this would be T times T is equal to T times T, or T applied to T, if we have a self-adjoint operator. Since T is equal to T dagger, T, T dagger is equal to T applied to T, which is the same then as T dagger T. But don't get led down that path completely. That's self-adjoint operators are normal, but not all normal operators are self-adjoint. Normal operators can actually include non-self-adjoint operators. And let's look at an example that's in the textbook. Suppose that we have a linear map T that has the following matrix representation. Suppose the matrix representation of our linear map T looks like 2 minus 3 in the top row and in the second row 3, 2. And let's call that A. Is it clear that this matrix representation does not, is not associated with a self-adjoint linear map. This is not self-adjoint. If it was, it would have to equal its transpose. In this case, it's real. So this linear map if we back it out or put it into this notation, what does it look like in terms of the first coordinate? What's the output of the first coordinate in terms of x and y? I now have this matrix. So this is now 2x minus 3y is the first coordinate. And what's the second coordinate? It's 3x plus 2y. Now, if we look at the matrix representation of the adjoint of that, then the adjoint map is now the transpose of that, so it's now 2, 3, minus 3, 2. And that's not equal to A, so let's call that B. Or if we now put this into T dagger X, Y, what does it look like in terms of first and second coordinates? 
you see that it's now 2x plus 3y for the first coordinate and minus 3x plus 2y for the second coordinate. And hopefully it's clear that that output, those two, the blue and the black, are not equivalent. So it's not self-adjoint. But what happens when we look at the matrix AB? That's now 2 minus 3, 3, 2, multiplying 2, 3, minus 3, 2. And you can do that however you want, but you should find that that gives you a diagonal with 13 on the diagonal. And now let's look at BA, which is now 2, 3, minus 3, 2 multiplying A, which is 2 minus 3, 3, 2. And that also will give you a diagonal. So even though the original map T is not self-adjoint, it is normal. And we'll have to pick up at that point in a week and get started with what these normal operators give us in terms of behaviors of norms and eigenvalues and eigenvectors.